one. Okay, welcome everyone to the Integrability Journal Club. Today we're very happy to have uh, Yung Feng Zhang from CERN. He will tell us about OPE coefficients in ABGM theory uh, with giants. Uh, please, Yung Feng. Okay, um, so first I would like to thank the organizers for the kind invitation. So it's always very nice to see uh, so many familiar faces and names, uh, even virtually. So today I'm going to uh, talk about some recent work where we compute OPE coefficients in uh, ABGM theory. Um, so this talk is based on the two papers that appeared in March on archive and in collaboration with uh, Shota Komatsu and uh, Tunbao, Shota Komatsu from CERN and uh, Tunbao Wu and uh, Bei He Yang from Tianjin University in China. Um, so uh, before going to uh, computing OP coefficients in ABGM theory, let me first give you a very brief overview about integrability in ADS-CFT. So uh, partly this is, uh, this is just a quick reminder uh, for all of us that uh, how much we have achieved and to serve as a motivation to go further. And the secondly, this also gives us a clear big picture and so that we can place where our work is in the big picture. Um, so in the past two decades, there has been a lot of development in the integrability in uh, ADS-CFT uh, correspondence. So our community uh, basically uh, made a lot of effort in solving these four type of theories uh, the first one is, of course, the famous n equals four super young mu theory. So this is a four-dimensional super young mu theory, and uh, it is dual to type two b super string theory in ADS five. And we know a lot of things about this theory. And then, uh, if we take one-dimensional lower, we have the ABJM theory. So this is a three-dimensional super consignment theory. And it is known to be dual to type 2a super string theory in ADS4. So if we go to uh, go even one dimensional lower, we have ADS3 CFT2 correspondence. Um, so in this case, we don't have like a precise specific field theory like n equals 4 or ABJM, but we have several families of uh, theories uh, with different choices of internal geometry and also fluxes. So recently, there has also been a lot of developments in this area, uh, both uh, with Walsh techniques, mainly for the NSNX flux, and also uh, from integrability, uh, uh, mainly for the Ramon Ramon flux and some mixed flux. Now, apart from these cases, there are also a very uh, important family, which are deformations of these theories. And this include the well-known beta and gamma deformations, and also uh, the fishnet theory also the fish train. So recently there has been a lot of uh, effort in fishnet theory because um, it is very simple and for computing many quantities, we can uh, resum Feynman diagrams. And this gives us a lot of exact results in uh, fishnet theories. So the general situation is that in all these kind of theories, the spectral problems are mostly solved in the planar limit. I say mostly solved. Um, I think uh, in N equals four and the ABJM is more close to, uh, to be really soft. But in uh, ADS3 and CFT2, um, this is not yet there because we don't yet have a common spectral curve formulation. But in any case, we know a lot of things about the spectrum for all these theories. Now, on the contrary, when we look at uh, higher point correlation functions, this means three, four, five, uh, and more point correlation functions, and finite coupling, uh, this is still an open question. So this is not uh, completely surprising, because even for very simple integrable models like the Heisenberg spin chain, computing correlation functions is much harder than just computing the spectrum. Um, so we, we know most things uh, in N equals four to play our mute theory, although the problem is not completely solved, but we know quite a bit. Yes. May I interrupt you just, uh, is the problem 
uh, ADS3, uh, ADS, uh, uh, for ADS3, uh, uh, is it considered to be sold? Uh, I don't think, I don't think so. Yeah. And also I would say uh, for, uh, for fishnets, it's not completely sold. There yes, are yes. no clear cut uh, equation for, for this problem. One can only study the, the full, uh, uh, let's say the full quantum spectral curve for ADS safety, but it's difficult. Okay, yes. just a comment. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Sure, thank you for the comment. Yeah, this is important. So that's why I use mostly solved and not uh, <laughs> really solved. I, because there are some I, I still loose board. ends. Yeah, but the point is to just to uh, compare the, spec the situation of the spectral problem with the higher point correlation function, mm -hmm. where we know much less. Uh, so the most studied case for higher point correlation functions is uh, N equals four, the Bayon mu theory. Uh, where we know quite a bit. Um, so at weak coupling, we have, uh, since each operator can be mapped to some spin chain states, so we can compute uh, higher point correlation functions by a combination of QFT calculations and the spin chain techniques. Um, so the QFT calculations is important uh, at higher loop orders, namely beyond tree level. Say at one loop, we will need to do this uh, QFT calculations to um, to give us the, the insertion to uh, to do the higher point uh, to do the higher loop computation. So using this te technology, uh, the three point functions has been computed in all the rank one sectors up to one loop. So this include the SU two sector, SL two sector, and the SU one slash one sector. And we also know quite a bit about four point functions of chiral primary operators. Uh, I think the four point uh, the full result is known up to four loops, uh, but then there are some partial results which are known as some much higher loop order. For example, the integrand are known, I think, either 10 or 12 loops. Uh, but in any case, I want to mention this uh, weak coupling part. Uh, it is very important because, um, because of two reasons. Firstly, uh, by computing this uh, structure constants or higher point correlation functions at weak coupling using integrability, we can already see some structures, integrable structures that might persist to higher loop orders and even at finite coupling. And secondly, they provide very important data for checking results. For example, if you come up with some, uh, some finite coupling prediction, then you will need to check this prediction at some point. And the weak coupling result gives you this uh, valuable data for checking the results. Uh, then moving to uh, strong coupling, uh, we, we know some results in various limits. So if the operator is light, it corresponds to uh, supergravity modes. And if we have heavy operators, it typically corresponds to some uh, semi-classical objects, like semi-classical semi strings. So then we can combine various technologies uh, in uh, string theory and uh, uh, supergravity. Uh, so we can compute, uh, say, the heavy, heavy light the uh, heavy, 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 and the light, light, light correlation functions. And we also know some results in the BMN sector where string theory becomes simple. And uh, we can also use the string field theory in this context. So these are, uh, we know, at weak and strong coupling. And then uh, an important breakthrough, as we all know, is the hexagon form factor approach at finite coupling. So this is the main approach, if not the only approach at uh, finite coupling. Um, so this approach uh, is a finite coupling formulation. So with this, we can calculate uh, a lot of results in uh, higher point correlation functions. Uh, for example, the three point function of PPS, BPS, non-BPS operators has been computed up to four loop orders, which is quite impressive. And in some cases, we can, uh, for example, strong coupling, semi-classical limit, we can do the resummation and give the prediction uh, it, uh, in a strong coupling. And this also has been applied to compute four-point functions and five-point functions, uh, and also uh, in computing uh, non-planar corrections. So all these results are very nice and uh, very impressive. So, uh, but can we say that uh, the correlation function problem is solved in n equals four? 
So at the moment, um, we uh, I think it's fair to say this is not yet the case. Uh, the main bottleneck for the finite coupling computation is the finite size corrections. So namely, if you want to compute higher point correlation functions with finite lengths, you will need to take into account Lucia type of uh, finite size corrections. So this is uh, at the moment only computed to, to one or two Lucia corrections, and that's already very, very technical. So how to do that, how to take into account all the infinitely many Lucia type corrections uh, is a very difficult problem. And uh, we still don't have a good way to, to solve this problem at the moment. Um, but uh, in the past few years, what people realize is that in some special cases, uh, there's a chance uh, we can take into account all these finite size corrections. And this happens in the case uh, for correlation functions with deep range. So let me just quickly give you the, the rough idea. So we know deep range uh, are boundary conditions in string theory. And uh, in ADS-CFT, sometimes these deep brains can correspond to uh, integrable boundaries. And the integrable boundary can be described by integrable boundary states. So some of these correlation functions involve deep brains can be uh, described as the overlap of integrable boundary state and some, uh, and some beta state. So this kind of uh, object is called a G function. So once you can identify a type of correlation function with a G function. Then from integrability uh, literature, we know that G function can be computed by TBA. And TBA takes into account all the finite size corrections. So roughly speaking, that's the idea. Uh, in slightly more detail, uh, if we are interested in uh, three-point functions of single trace operators, so this corresponds to uh, schematically to the overlap of some cubic vertex with uh, three states. Um, but for some cases, uh, correlators involving deep brains are much simpler. It's given by this object, uh, by the overlap of the boundary state and an eigenstate. So the boundary state corresponds to the deep brain and, uh, and the eigenstate correspond to the single trace operator. Now in ADS-CFT, uh, D brains can correspond to uh, various quantities. So uh, the few examples are the following. So we know sometimes D brains can uh, correspond to giant gravitons, and this will be the main thing we will be considering in this talk. And the D brains sometimes also correspond to surface defects. So in this case, uh, this overlap will be computing the defect one point function. And yet sometimes the brains also correspond to Wilson loops. And in this case, this will be computing the Wilson loop one point function. So this is uh, so much for um, N equals four super young mu theory. Uh, we know quite a bit, it's not completely solved, but we have hope. This is like the pandemic, so we have hope. Now, moving to, um, to ABJM theory, we can ask this question. So what about ABJM theory? because we also want to solve these other examples in uh, integrability in ADS-CFT. So when we look uh, at the literature, we realize that immediately that this is much less explored. Uh, for example, at weak coupling, uh, the only integrability uh, computation that I know is, uh, is a computation in the SU2 cross SU2 sector at tree level. And we, we don't have any uh, one loop or two loop results in the planar limit, like in N equals four, even for uh, small subsectors. And we don't have higher point uh, correlation functions like the four point function of Cairo operators in, the, uh, in N equals four super young mu theory. So this means we have very limited data at weak coupling. And as strong coupling is similar, we, we know something, we know some correlation functions uh, of the heavy, heavy light type. And uh, very recently, we, we have some data from, the, from Bootstrap about four point functions of light operators. But that's it. That's uh, pretty much we know about uh, correlation functions in, in ABJM theory. And uh, of course, the most important thing is at finite coupling, we don't have anything like hexagon. So we would say that compared to N equals four, uh, 
the situation in ABGM theory is pretty sad. So one of our motivations is to try to uh, improve the situation by computing correlation functions in uh, ABGM theory. Now, as I commented uh, in the previous slide, that correlation functions involving D-brains might be easier uh, to compute compared to the correlation functions of uh, three single trace operators. And that's why we want to start uh, from this uh, direction. Uh, especially at finite coupling, I think we have a better hope to, to solve this problem uh, to when we compute correlation functions with D-brains. Can I ask a, a quick question, please? Uh, sure. Uh, what, would, uh, what do we know about the three BPS operators in ABJM? Can you summarize a little bit? You mean the BPS operators? Three uh, correlation functions, three BPS operators. It's not protected, right? As yes. in N equals one. What yeah. do we know about it? Uh, in ABGM, I think um, there are people computed that uh, three single trace BPS operators um, using, I forgot, uh, either localization or there are some localization results, but it's not, uh, but it's in a different limit. It's not in the planar limit that uh, we are interested in. And there are also some results in. Uh, involving two BPS giant gravitons and the one uh, BPS single trace operators. And, um, but all these results, which if we know it at finite coupling, this is uh, by localization and by localization is in, in some different uh, limit, is not in the planar limit. Are there also some simple results for three prime functions at weak coupling by Marco Bianchi and uh, other people? including myself. <laughs> yeah, so if, if there are audience who knows better this part, uh, you're welcome to comment. The reason why I ask this is, I think that looking at um, just BPS three-point functions and seeing uh, even in at weak coupling, how at which order the various perturbative corrections come about could give an important hint about this hexagon, right? Because yeah. We would believe that if there is some hexagons that give the three point function for two BPS operator for BPS operators, right? Mm -hmm. We have no excitation for BPS operators, so it's all about finite size correction. So we might not know the details, but we could guess at which loop orders they should come about based on wrapping, right? Mm -hmm. And so, my question would be if we had data that we could check that, that for example, for large BPS operators, corrections are delayed, and then when they are smaller, the corrections appear, but they appear at the loop order that we expect, and so on. So that's yeah. what I what I had in mind. I don't know if someone knows the answer to this. Mm -hmm. So at which loop order do we get loop corrections to three BPS operators? Is this known as a function of the size of the operator? This I don't know. Yeah. But it's, it's good to check. Yeah. Okay. So um, let me continue. So as I said, we, uh, we have two papers um, computing this uh, correlation functions in ABGM theory. Uh, the first paper, and uh, so naturally this, the rest of this talk will be uh, divided into two parts. Uh, so in the first part, we'll be mainly considered, uh, we'll be considering the weak coupling computation. Uh, so we'll discuss the setup and also the spin chain related to this. And, um, and then in the second part, uh, we will be talking about the strong coupling calculation. And in this part, mostly, most of the time, I will be uh, discussing what is the correct prescription for the computation. So that I will use uh, N equals four super young mu theory as a check. And once we establish the correct uh, prescription, we can use it to, uh, to do computation <coughs> in ABGM theory and uh, give concrete predictions in uh, ABGM theory. Um, so let me start with the, with the weak coupling discussion. So uh, before computing correlation functions, just some quick reminder about ABGM theory. So this is a super symmetric transcendence theory. So this means that the gauge part of the action takes a transcendence form instead of F mu mu F mu mu. And uh, for transcendence theory, there's a parameter K in front, which is the transcendence level. And then there's the gauge group, 
which is un times un. So there are two uns, and uh, here this k is the transignments group. So actually there are two uh, gauge fields. Uh, I just wrote one of them. So for ABGM theory, we have uh, two important parameters, uh, the rank of the gauge group n and the transignments level k. And then you can take different limits. So one interesting limit is to take k fixed and uh, n very large. This is the so-called M theory limit, because in this uh, limit, uh, ABGM theory can tell us something about the mysterious M theory. So for integrability, it's uh, more interesting to consider the planar limit, where we take n and a k to, uh, to be very large, but we keep the ratio fixed. So the global symmetry of this uh, theory is OSP 6 slash 4, where the bosonic uh, subgroups are SO6, which is the R symmetry group, and the SP4, which is the same as SO3.3,2, that is the conformal symmetry in three dimensions. So the field content of this theory, uh, it consists of two gauge fields because we have U1 cross U, uh, UN cross UN, and they sit in the joint representation. And then we have uh, uh, four complex scalar fields together with their, their complex conjugate. Now it's important to, to realize that these uh, complex scalars, they sit in the bifundamental representation. And also we have four uh, vial spinners. They also sit in the bifundamental representation. So the scalar fields are our main interest. In, in this works. So we'll be considering uh, the operators in the scalar SU4 sector. So this means we will consider um, the uh, gauge invariant operators that are made of the scalar fields. Now, because they sit in the bifundamental representation, uh, so to construct a gauge invariant operators, we always need to take a pair. So we always need to take a pair Y, Y dagger, Y, Y dagger, and uh, and then we take the trace. So this will give us the, the gauge invariant operators. Now, in terms of the spin chain language, uh, this kind of thing corresponds to an uh, alternating spin chain, where uh, at the, each side, the representation uh, at each side is alternating. Um, so for the, in the spin chain language, it's uh, important to distinguish the vacuum uh, and the excitations. So as a convention, we take uh, the vacuum at each off side as, you, as y1 and uh, each even side as a y4 dagger. Um, so we will be interested in two kinds of uh, operators. The first one is the giant graviton. So these are some subdeterminant operators and it is constructed like this. Again, we have this, this pair y, y dagger and uh, we also have this vector, this four vector n and m bar, which we use to uh, contract the four scalars. And then we have m of these pairs. Uh, so here this uh, delta symbol means that uh, we take two epsilon symbols and we contract m minus m indices. So this is a subdeterminant operator. So this number m, must be smaller or equal to the rank n. So in the maximal case, uh, m equals to n. And to impose the BPS condition, I take uh, n dot m bar equals to zero. So you see each giant graviton uh, operator uh, is given by uh, this parameter m and uh, its uh, space-time coordinate and also two vectors, n and m bar. And similarly, we can construct a single trace operator. Uh, if it's a BPS operator, we can uh, construct it uh, similar to here. We take this pair and uh, take the Lth power and take the trace. And if it's a non-BPS operator, it's a linear combination of such bases. Okay, so these are the two type of uh, operators that we are interested in. Uh, now, first we, uh, consider a two-point function. So this is a CFT. So the two-point function is uh, fixed up to uh, normalization, where this D is just the, the propagator uh, and the, in the numerator, you have the scalar product and I dot M bar J. So this is simple. And uh, now we consider the three-point function. So we are interested in the three-point function of uh, two 
giant gravitons and one single trace operator. Um, it is given by this formula, and now I want to uh, draw your attention to this sum. So if it's in the uh, n equals 4 super young mu, this is just, just a number, the structure constant. Uh, but here we have a sum over, say, the tensor structure. And this psi is the SU4 cross ratio. Uh, as we see, all these uh, operators, they depend on some polarization, ni and ni bar. And from these NIs, you can construct an SU4 invariant cross ratio. Um, so this is similar to the situation in N equals four. If you compute three point functions of spinning operators, then you have to sum over these structure, uh, these tensor structures. Uh, but in N equals uh, in ABGM is more complicated because even for the um, even for the scalar operators, you have a sum over these tensor structures given by this cross ratio. So in principle, if you want to compute uh, a length L correlation function like this, then you will need to compute L plus one numbers. So, uh, so to simplify our lives, uh, I will consider a special case, which are the correlation functions in the twisted translated frame. Uh, so the idea is to uh, first construct the operator at the origin and then perform the twist translation. So the twist translation is generated by, uh, by this generator where P2 is the translation in the Y direction and R41 is the rotation in the internal space. So the twisted translation basically means once you do the twist, you do, uh, you do a rotation in the internal space at the same time, and uh, uh, you need to coordinate these two. So um, then we construct the following operators. So we construct a subdetermined operator at the origin, then we perform the twisted translation, and then we also construct an um, non-BPS or BPS single trace operators, and then perform the twisted translation. So once we consider- Sorry, Yunfeng, Yun sorry. I missed it probably. You probably said it. What is zero comma A comma zero refer to? Zero. The, ar the, the oh, argument, okay. yeah. These are the space-time coordinates. It's a three-dimensional field theory. So. Okay, sorry. thanks. Okay. And if you consider operators like this, uh, say you take um, different uh, values of A, which is the value of twisted translation. So you take A1, A2, and A3, and you find that uh, this is given by, uh, by the following structure. So now you only have one uh, number to compute, and we will be computing this number uh, in, in what follows. Um, so let me make a comment here. So in the twisted translated frame, our SU4 cross ratio C equals to minus one. And that's why you, this, uh, this sum over C just collapsed. So you are effectively computing this uh, sum over this few numbers. And also this is not only a trick to simplify our life. Uh, it is also very important at, uh, at finite coupling in order to uh, bootstrap. So this twisted translated frame was already introduced in N equals four and play an important role in the, in the hexagon formalism and also in uh, other computations. So we, here we also do it in the ABGM theory. So now the, the question we are facing is how to compute this number using integral plating. And as I said before, we are in the SU4 sector. So uh, we have a spin chain and we need to say something about the spin chain. So this is the Hamiltonian. Uh, of the SU4 alternating spin chain. Um, at each side, uh, at each odd side, we have a field, scalar field Ya, which can be mapped to some, uh, to some vector A, where A goes from one to four. And at each even side, we have Ya dagger, and this is mapped to some A bar, which also runs from one to four. So in this Hamiltonian, we have the permutation operator P, and then we have this uh, operator K. So notice that permutation operator only permutes the same type of uh, excitations because it's L, L minus two is next to nearest neighboring. 
And this K operator, it uh, mixes two type, different types of uh, excitations. So this is the usual, usual thing that we know. Uh, so the important thing is this Hamiltonian, although uh, looks complicated, but it's integrable and can be diagonalized by beta and Um So I will not bother you with all the details of, of the beta and Zuss, but I will show you some, uh, some very important difference between this kind of spin chain and the usual spin chain that we see in N equals four. Um, so in our paper, we give a detailed prescription for how to uh, write down the coordinate beta and Zuss to compute, uh, to construct the eigenstate of the Hamiltonian. So this is a nested coordinate beta and Zuss, and as expected, the wave function is rather complicated. Uh, and here is the, the thinking diagram for the, for the beta and Zuss. So we need to notice that there are two momentum carrying nodes, which are this uh, gray colored uh, nodes. So we denote uh, the rapidity associated to these three nodes by u, v, uh, u, v, and w, where w is the auxiliary nodes. Uh, so the momentum carry nodes are the ones uh, whose rapidity appears in the energy formula. So we see that if you construct a uh, eigenstate with u, v, and w, then the energy is given by this formula, where the u type and v type of rapidity appears in the energy formula. So this is different from the n equals force by a muse case where we have only one uh, momentum carry node. And here also, if you remove this uh, auxiliary node, you, you got two decoupled uh, SU2, SU2 spin chain. Um, so we constructed this coordinate beta and Zuss, uh, and we constructed state, many states up to uh, lens eight where things becomes uh, rather complicated. But in any case, we can, we can have very concrete states to, to work with. Um, and this is the beta equations. Uh, we can see that the U equations and the V equations are, are basically symmetric and uh, they are the momentum carrying nodes. So the beta equation is, uh, is important and is also related to the, to the Goldan conjecture which is an important ingredient we need for the computation. So uh, in n equals four and uh, in, in the usual spin chains, uh, we know that the uh, norm of a beta state, of a given beta state is proportional to the Godin determinant. So to, to do, and uh, so this is observed in uh, many, many spin chains, but most of them, we don't have a rigorous proof uh, for, for that. And now, to um, compute the norm in the alternating spin chain with two momentum carrying nodes, we also need to check whether this is true. And uh, indeed, using all the data that we have, uh, we check this is indeed the case, uh, namely the norm of this SU4 alternating spin chain also satisfies the Godin conjecture. So uh, it is proportional to the determinant of uh, the uh, Godin matrix with the with some prefactors that depends on normalization. So we check this for all the available states uh, that we have up to L equals to eight. And also um, here, another comment is that uh, since we constructed this coordinate bit on us, I believe it can be also be used to compute other kinds of three point functions like three single chase operators. So this can also be an interesting question. So we can make use of this uh, coordinate bit on us. Okay, so now we have a discussion about how to construct eigenstates. And now our question is how to compute the structure constant. So basically I, I'm going to show you and I will show you that uh, this structure constant is computed by the overlap of certain integral boundary state B and uh, a beta state, which, is, which diagonalizes the Hamiltonian that we just discussed and this beta state correspond to the single chase operator and this boundary state correspond to, um, correspond to the giant gravitons. So the method we are using is, this, is the similar method to generalize a little bit uh, as we did in N equals four, Sylvia mu theory, which is the large and effective field theory. Or we can also do this uh, partially contracted giant graviton. Uh, but this method is more general. Uh, so let me introduce uh, a bit uh, in a bit more detail. 
so what we are interested in is computing this uh, three-point function, dm1, dm2, and o. So the first step is we want to write it in, in terms of some generating function, uh, g2, where g2 is, deter is defined by this uh, curly g1, g2, the correlation function of curly g1, g2, and o, the same single trace operator. And this gj is given by this determinant. So basically, we like determinants. Determinants are our friends because we can write determinants as the path integral of certain fermions. And in this way, we can introduce fermions. So that's why we want to write in determinants. So uh, as promised, we can write this gj as the path integral of some, some fermions. And then we can plug this form here. So this is the g2 uh, in path integral, where this s is the ABGM, uh, is the ABGM action at tree level. Once we plug this in, uh, then this exponent, uh, this exponential will combine with this guy and uh, give you some action like this. So we have we now have the integral over the, the scalar field and the fermionic fields. And then we can what we can do is we can integrate out the scalar fields because uh, at tree level this uh, this are Gaussian. So we can integrate it out and we are left with the integral over uh, the fermionic fields. And this is what we get. Uh, now, the original uh, operator O uh, depends on the scalar fields Y. So when we integrate out this Y, uh, what does it become? So it will become the following object, uh, namely you replace each Y by some quantity SI, which is given explicitly in this form. And uh, here this S tilde is given explicitly here. So basically uh, in the second step, we just we rewrite this uh, generating function as the integral over some fermionic fields and with this operator replaced uh, by this object OS. Uh, now, since we have fermions, it's, uh, it's a good idea to do the Haber Stratonovich transformation. So, this is the third step. Uh, namely, we, uh, we integrate in some bilocal fields, which I call rho and rho bar. So, and I integrate in this rho and rho bar, and I can integrate out again the fermions to obtain some field theory that to obtain some theory that depends on rho and rho bar. These are some uh, useful tricks you use a lot in, in other contexts also. But why do I want to do that? The key point is that once I introduce these uh, rows and integrate out the fermions, I get an effective action. And this effective action has an n in front of it. So this means in the large n theory, in the large n limit, uh, I can use the saddle point approximation in this form. So this row integral actually can be computed uh, very simply by taking the saddle point of, the, of this uh, effective action. So this can be computed. And, and then, so after we use the saddle point equation, so this guy, uh, before was write, written in terms of fermions, but once you integrate out fermions, this is given in terms of rho. And then you can just plug in the saddle point uh, value for this rho. So this will give you the following expression. So to sum up, after all this whole procedure in the large n limit, what we obtain is that if you start with this operator OY, this trace YA, Y dagger B1 and so on, then at the end, you obtain the trace of some, uh, some metrics, TA1, TB, uh, TB1 bar. So now uh, the upshot is that this TA and TB, they are two by two matrices and we can compute them explicitly. So finally, uh, each of this uh, single trace operator is mapped to this kind of uh, trace and this can be rewritten as the, the product, uh, as the overlap between a matrix product state and some basis state. So that's, and, and we know that the beta state is a linear combination of these basis states. So that uh, gives us the, um, the formula that we uh, promised at the beginning. So here, I just want to mention this TA and TB. Uh, we know them explicitly and they depend on two parameters. So one parameter is this C, which is the SU4 cross ratio. 
and in the twisted uh, translated frame, we, we put it to minus one. And the other parameter is omega, which is uh, described the size of giant graviton. So it's given by the ratio of m divided by n. And uh, for the maximal case, we can take omega equals to one. By any case, okay, we have established that um, our structure constant is basically the overlap between the matrix product state and our beta state. And we know this matrix product state explicitly. We also know this beta state from our coordinate beta on us. So then we just need to do this computation. And then by looking at the data of our, our result, uh, we obtain this uh, selection rules. Namely, we find that um, this overlap is only non-zero if these conditions are satisfied. So the first condition is this J charge, which is determined, uh, defined by length minus this uh, number is even, it has to be even. And we also find that uh, the main roots have to be uh, opposite to each other as, um, as a set. So V must equals minus U. So then, and the auxiliary roots have to be paired. So uh, if KW is even, is uh, W1 minus W1, then W2 minus W2 and so on. And if it's odd, then one of them has to be zero and the rest is paired. So this is, this kind of structure is very familiar in the computation, in similar computations in uh, N equals four the way mu theory and uh, in the, uh, in the quench problem. So we checked all this, uh, we checked these rules for all the available states up to L equals to uh, length equals to eight. And of course, more checks are welcome, um, but it, for that, we need to generate more states and, and perform this calculation. Uh, but with the data, we are more or less convinced that this should be the rule. Um, there is a question. Kostya? Uh, um, have you checked that this uh, that the boundary state is annihilated by, say, the third charge, the, the next charge of the hierarchy? Ah, uh, this we haven't checked, hmm. but it would be good to check. Uh, we we only check this uh, selection rule. Yeah. Yes, but uh, you know, you see this uh, this uh, fact that you have paired roots. Uh, is usually a sign that the matrix product state is uh, integrable. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And there is this uh, criterion, uh, so in n equals four at least, mm -hmm. that the oddly, uh, the odd, uh, the, the charges with an odd parity, they annihilate. So of course, Q3, and mm -hmm. also the higher charges and this uh, pairing, whenever you see it. But I don't know in this case, yeah, probably one could also so that uh, yeah this would be just complementary check it's uh, yeah indeed indeed yes uh, in fact did this for up to length eight but indeed act to find explicit yeah, I, I or then you can do it for any length yeah yeah that's um that's probably a better check and we should probably first do it to just make sure this this really is an integral boundary state but with the data we're more or less convinced that it is and so this is the, the selection rule that we observed. And uh, once could I, this Sorry, could I just ask a follow-up question or oh, slightly unrelated? Do you expect these uh, selection rules to hold in the strict BMN limit as well? In the BMN limit? In other words, if I studied a correlation function between a D-brain and, and some state in the strict BMN limit, would I find the such conditions as well? So, you know, or whatever the limit of these conditions is. Right? Yeah, so I, I think um, if you can take uh, the BMN limit at the level of beta, beta states, then they should be satisfied, right? I mean, it sort of becomes, uh, uh, well, you know, I explain well, it becomes trivial, but- are, are Rather, in some sense, a bit trivial. Um, but there are definitely conditions for, you know, which uh, a, a closed string states couple uh, to D brains and which don't. Right? And so I, it, it's quite conceivable that if you took a, a state with three excitations, one on the left and two on the right, I mean, I can't quite do the calculation in my head. I think, I think that should be zero. 
the one mm -hmm. the one point function. Whereas if you took something that had two excitations on the left and two on the right, then it would be non-zero. But one would have to check in a bit more detail. But I wonder if, yeah. I see. I see. Yeah, oh. it's, it's going to be checked. Related to this question of Bogdan, uh, has it been checked that uh, this overlap between the MPS and some PP wave limit in, in the PP wave limit uh, matches with, uh, I mean, we know the boundary state for the deep brain. Mm -hmm. You can start with some uh, genetic state. Does this actually match even in N equal to four? Like, like uh, in, yeah. So uh, just remind me, uh, is this computation done in N equals four already? Uh, I mean, the, the BMM, so I, I mean, we haven't checked this. Uh, in no, I mean, it's a very simple question that I'm asking. So in the PPWF limit, you have a boundary state corresponding to some deep brain. You yes. can just can just use the BMN correspondence to overlap it with some uh, very like two excitation state. It's mm -hmm. a very straightforward computation. Yes. What I'm asking is that does that agree with this overlap between MPS and uh, some some uh, bulk state? Um, yeah, we haven't tried that, but uh, it's it's interesting. It's an interesting question. It, yeah, we never thought about BML limit, but okay. now that you mentioned that, I think it's it's interesting to to look at into that. Yeah, thanks. Uh, okay, so here is here are the selection rules. Uh, so once these selection rules are, are satisfied, uh, what's the result? We also have this uh, nice formula. Um, again, it's very similar to what we have seen in uh, N equals four surveillance mills, where the uh, structure constant in this case is given by a ratio of determinant G plus and G minus. And so the G plus and G minus, they come from uh, this Godin norm, uh, this Godin determinant when you impose the selection rule. So when you impose the selection rules, the uh, Godin determinant factorizes in this case. And then uh, the result is given by this ratio and uh, together with, uh, with some prefactors. Uh, so uh, there are two comments. Uh, the first comment is that indeed it is, uh, it is the same structure as we have seen in N equals four, although this uh, alternating spin chain with, with uh, with two uh, momentum carrying nodes and so on. And another comment is that this, is, uh, this formula is defined up to uh, phase ambiguity. So uh, because we know the structure constant uh, uh, by themselves ambiguous up to uh, phase ambiguity. Um, so this is um, the result at, at the weak coupling. So I think this is the natural uh, breaking point for the first part. So if you have other questions or comments or ideas, I'm happy to discuss. Hi. Uh, thanks. Is there a super symmetric uh, generalization of this formula? <laughs> no. <laughs> but it shouldn't be very difficult to uh, what would it be? What would it be? So uh, we want to go to say the the full sector, I mean, yes. you, you mean involving all this, all the fermions and, uh, and all the bosons that in, in a higher rank sector. So then, I mean, you can conjecture that, but how do you check it? Uh, you would need to construct the states, right? And that's, the, that's actually the, the difficult part, one of the difficult part. How to come up with the coordinate beta on those and write down all this horrible states and then do this computation. That's, uh, I think, yeah, I agree. It, it, looking at the structure, it should be some natural generalizations to the supersymmetric case, but the difficulty lies in how to check them. Mm -hmm. Sorry, Yunfen, maybe I have related to what Kosti is asking. I, I'm just thinking what, what could be the problem, say, if you proceed with this <clears throat> effective prescription, I mean, the as effective, once you have done reshifts and uh, you have introduced Hubble straton issue or even before this. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, uh, would it be possible, if, if it is possible, say, to do supersymmetrization in, in this formalism, uh, is, would it be possible after that to proceed with, I don't know, with what Shota and Yifan were doing or similarly? 
because what you show here it is yeah probably very conventional and consistent with weak coupling result or and those uh, to localize this so essentially is it possible to bring this as effective uh, form uh, suitable for uh, this generalized, generalized super localization that uh, I think Ivan tried to use for defects. Mm. So um, let me see if I understand you correctly. So mm -hmm. you, you want to generalize this um, uh, large and effective field theory to uh, also include fermions. Yep. Is that correct? I, I don't see any uh, like uh, obstacle for, for that. Yeah, that's my point. Yes. Because what, what I was worrying is, is once you generalize to this uh, higher rank sector, then how do you construct the, the other part, namely the beta states that I don't know. Right. But that's if you want, uh, yeah, I agree. But this is if you want to, to proceed with, with the say, uh, this in uh, sorry you probably don't really worry about homogeneities right in homogeneities uh, was the coordinate ba is that uh, you want to use but uh, in a way uh, that uh, that's what i'm trying to say uh, wang and uh, kamatsu probably are doing they uh, worry about uh, but that's probably a, a separate approach because they worry about uh, boundary conditions and and how uh, your setup would correspond to this uh, brain construction but the, but the structure is just to, 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 to bring it in, in, in some, if you want, matrix consistent uh, localizable form, which is uh, probably doesn't really uh, depend on, on the form of the functional you want to use. Yeah, that I can, I can comment. So as I said, this uh, giant gravitons, uh, defect, and the Wilson loop, they all correspond to d brains. Sure. And then uh, for all these three cases, you can use the same technique, like I, I just explained here. So it's mainly, it's the same thing. You, you do the, you introduce fermions and then you integrate them out. So you have some effective large end theories. It just, the details of these effective large end theories are, are slightly different in these three cases. Sure, sure. And the simplest case is the giant graviton here. But of course, I agree that it's an interesting question. I'm in insistent. Oh, I'm exactly insistent on the on the on your second point. Yeah, uh, was a defect. Mm -hmm. I guess Anton is asking if you can go to higher loops. No, 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 uh, no, no. Well, even even be, 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 be before Charlotte. Okay, okay, all right. Yeah, but uh, the higher loops probably or the strong coupling would be also, of course. Yeah, yeah. to do the higher loops, we we really. Well, we first need someone to compute this uh, field theory insertions. Mm -hmm. and, and then uh, we will need to know something like theta morphism or theta fixing in, in this uh, alternating spin chain case. Uh -huh. right? Yeah. So all this needs uh, some real effort, uh, like to generalize the results we know in n equals four to ABJM. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I think, well, it's, it's less explored, but uh, it's, it's an interesting question how we can deal with this. But I thought there was also a work from the South African group, uh, something very similar. So what is the difference? You mean uh, Robert and the yes. collaborator? Yes. Um, yeah. This part of a large and effective field theory, I think is, um, is the same, but uh, they didn't do the SU4 beta and that's and then compute that. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Yun Feng? Yes. Just, just a second. Uh, can I say that we are already in, uh, in, uh, in coffee break and let me pause the recording? Yes. Okay. Um, yeah. So um, we have discussed uh, weak coupling computation and now let's go to the strong coupling. As I mentioned in the introduction, so at the strong coupling, I will be uh, devoting uh, most of the time to explain uh, or to establish what is the, a good description for, um, for computing this relation functions as strong coupling. And uh, so uh, to do this, I will focus on n equals four super young mules. 
because uh, the three point function in n equals four uh, for PPS operators, they are protected. And so I can make meaningful comparison between the strong coupling computation and the weak coupling computation and check whether my prescription is good. And then once we establish this uh, good prescription, we can apply it to the uh, ABGM theory and uh, give concrete prediction. Um, so as I was saying, uh, let's first recall quickly uh, the holographic setup in uh, n equals four super young mills. So again, we have the giant gravitons, which are subdeterminant operators. And in, in holography, it corresponds to um, three brain extended in S5 dimension. So in ADS, it's like a point, but this is a local operator, but it's extended in the internal space, uh, S5. And then we also consider a single chase BPS operator and that corresponds to a uh, super gravity mode. So then the three point function we are interested in is of the type heavy, heavy light. So uh, heavy, heavy light uh, three point function Holographic prescription was first proposed uh, in a paper by Costia Zarembo in 2010. Now, uh, roughly speaking, in this picture, that uh, these black lines are the heavy states, and uh, they correspond to some semi-classical state. So you can use some semi-classical string solutions uh, to describe this part, and then the light part is the supergravity fluctuation uh, on the, along the uh, wall sheet. So this is a very nice prescription and has been applied to many heavy, heavy light computations. And in particular, it has been applied to the giant graviton one point function uh, in this paper. Uh, at that time, uh, there was a seemingly small problem with this prescription. And uh, the problem is that this semi-classical solution has a moduli space. Uh, this means the classical solution uh, is not just one solution. Actually, there's a family of solutions. So the question is, uh, since there's a family of solutions which are equally good, when you do this computation, which solution do you choose? And there was some loose end in that prescription. Um, so back then, you can just take just one of the solutions and, and then do the computation. Uh, so this problem was pointed out already uh, in a paper by Bynod Yannick and Vyshinsky in 2014. So there they proposed that uh, the correct prescription uh, is to take an average over the moduli space. So namely, you need to take into account all this, this family of solutions, and then you need to take an average. And this is called the orbit average. So it, in the same paper, it has been applied to the computation of heavy, heavy light structure constant of three single chase operators. So here, we just want to emphasize that in the computation of two giant gravitons and one single chase operator, it is also very important to take into account this orbit average. And then there is something new, uh, which is something new in our paper, uh, that previously, when we compute heavy, heavy light structure constant, uh, we usually consider the case where these two heavy operators are of the same charge. So this corresponds to some diagonal uh, form factor, but actually we show that we can do slightly better. We can consider the three point function where the two uh, heavy guys uh, have slightly different charge. For example, we can consider this D to be with the charge M plus K, where K is much smaller than M so that it will not modify the settle point. And uh, these two are the crucial uh, new ingredient that we need to uh, establish the prescription. So let me uh, explain in a bit more detail uh, using a very simple toy model. So this model was actually uh, proposed in this paper in the context of uh, large charge effective field theory, but uh, let's discuss this first. So we consider a quantum mechanical system uh, described by some action as theta. Uh, theta is like the coordinate uh, on, the, on the circle. So this system, let's suppose it has a symmetry, a U1 symmetry. This means if you shift this theta uh, by any constant, then uh, is the same, this S is invariant. And in this uh, quantum mechanical system, we are interested in computing this heavy, heavy light uh, of uh, correlation function or this uh, diagonal form factor where we take this uh, U1 charge J 
to be uh, very, very large. So if this J is very large, we can uh, compute this quantity in the semi-classical analysis uh, in the WKB uh, approximation. So we take this J very large and the H bar goes to zero with the uh, product fixed. And then we can express this quantity uh, in the path integral form where uh, this exponential minus ij theta is just the WKB wave function. And uh, this O is, uh, this is the, the wave function of the operator O. So, uh, and we're, we are doing the semi-classical analysis so we can consider the settle point is dominated by the settle point. So we can find the settle point equation. Uh, this is a standard story. Now, because we have this U1 symmetry. So if we have one set of point solution, say uh, theta zero star, then uh, by shifting it by some amount C, it is also a solution. So in fact, we have a family of solutions called theta star C, parameterized by this C. So then uh, in order to compute this, uh, this path integral, what do we do? Do we fix some, uh, some C? Uh, uh, actually, no. So the, the correct, a prescription is to take an average over the C. So this is what this integral is doing. So C goes from zero to two pi and we take this average. So once we take this average and then we take epsilon goes to zero and, and then this is what we obtained. So we have this guy and then we need to take this uh, orbit average. Um, so in the paper of uh, Bynog Yannick and Rashinsky, they already pointed out that taking this average actually has the effect of uh, converting a coherent state into an eigenstate, which is actually the thing we're interested in. And also this, uh, taking this average uh, physically restore the symmetry uh, that we have for this theory. Because if we, if we pick a specific C, it will break U1 symmetry we start with. So we need to take uh, this uh, average. And now we do a slightly uh, more general analysis. Let's consider some uh, slightly off diagonal structure constant, where, uh, as I said before, this K is much smaller than M. So again, uh, we first analyze our toy model. So this quantity will correspond to the quantity where uh, we take uh, one charge to be J plus Q, where Q is much smaller than J. And again, you do the same uh, WKB analysis, you have these wave functions. Um, but then what you find is that here, there's an additional piece. So we see if you take uh, epsilon goes to zero, uh, this part cancels with that. And then you have a, a, a portion uh, that is proportional to Q, and this gives a new contribution. And that is the contribution from the, from the heavy state, on the wave function of the heavy state. So uh, to summarize, to compute this kind of quantity, uh, first you need to take into account the contribution from the wave function, and then you need to take this integral over C. Okay, now with that, uh, we are ready to um, consider the structure constant that we are interested in. So we consider two uh, giant gravitons with different charges, slightly different charges. Then we write it in the path integral form now this psi star and psi, they are just wave functions corresponding to the uh, giant gravitons. And then we have this action which describes the D-brain. So it's the sum of the DBI action and the West Mino term. Uh, so as before, uh, there's a symmetry. So there's a family a moduli space of the classical solution. And uh, so the moduli space is uh, the following. So we have two U1 charges. One is the conformal dimension, delta, and the other is related to the U1 R charge, J. So these uh, two symmetries are uh, generated by the dilatation operator and also this rotation. Uh, so in more detail, suppose you have some X, which is a solution. Then if you shift this time by one minus I tau zero and this phi by a phi plus phi zero, this is again, a solution. So this is the, the moduli space. And the effect of shifting this um, T and phi by this amount uh, will also uh, reflect it 
in the shift in the wave function. So the wave function is proportional uh, to this combination. And once you do the shift, uh, you change your wave function by multiplying this amount. So taking into account these two effects, uh, we have our master formula, which is the, the prescription uh, for us to do the computation. We see that this part, which is the difference of dimension and the difference of R charge, uh, this is the wave function contribution. And then we have these two additional integrals over tau zero and phi zero. So this is the orbit average. And now if we know this part, this O hat, um, then we can compute. So in a bit more details, uh, this O hat is the uh, fluctuation of, uh, is the fluctuation of the DBI and the West Lumino action. So this is actually known in the literature, uh, for example, in this paper, and it's easy to generalize it uh, to our case. So the, the bottom line is that we know this uh, very explicitly. And then what we need to do is just to plug this uh, explicit expression uh, to our master formula and compute integrals. So let me show you the result of this computation. Uh, so for the diagonal structure constant, uh, our result is uh, given by this, where, where P is the Legendre polynomial. And this cosine theta is related, cosine theta zero is related to the size of the giant uh, graviton, where this is a ratio of M divided by N. So we find this uh, rather non-trivial result. And then we can compare with the field theory result uh, which is also computed in our paper. And we found a very non-trivial perfect match between the strong and weak coupling computation. And we mentioned that if we don't do this uh, average, the result does not match. And then we can also do the off-diagonal uh, structure constant. And this is a bit uh, even more complicated with the hypergeometric functions. And this computation can also be, be done uh, at weak coupling. So at weak coupling, we can, uh, at weak coupling, we can also do, uh, use the large end effective field theory to compute the same uh, structure constant. And then again, we find a perfect match uh, between these uh, complicated results. So this is a, a strong test because the result we obtain are highly non-trivial and the match is really nice and a strong test for our prescription. And uh, so finally, uh, once we have tested uh, this uh, prescription for the computation uh, in n equals four, we can just move to, uh, to ABJM. So here I just show you the final result. So basically the calculation is very similar. And uh, so we, we know all the ingredients and uh, we have two uh, U1 charges. So we know how to uh, compute this thing explicitly. And we obtain this uh, even more complicated uh, result. But in this case, we, we only computed, uh, we, I, I'm only showing you uh, the diagonal structure constant. And uh, it might look a bit uh, complicated. So here this alpha is again related to the size of the giant graviton. So um, can I ask a question? question? You're fine. Yes. yes. So, so yeah, it's very impressive, very nice that we can get the match. But uh, I'm curious, you could also do this computation beyond heavy, heavy light, right? You could a priori, at least at weak coupling. Can you do three heavy operators at weak coupling? And is there some nice uh, structure? And does it hint about uh, uh, how to do the computation at strong coupling? At strong coupling, is it true that three heavy, it looks super complicated or am I wrong? Uh Actually, um, so how heavy do you want to want this uh, single chase operator to be? Because this uh, time gravitons are like uh, the order of n. So what do you want Sorry, to do? Sorry, I'm, I'm, I should have been more explicit. I meant three Ds, not uh, two Ds and one O. Uh, three Ds, okay. Yeah. If I understand uh, correctly, three Ds would be protected, right? So, yes. but naively from a holographic point of view, it looks super hard. 
Yeah. So is it true, first of all, that you could compute three Ds using your technique, and second, uh, how would the computation at strong coupling go for three Ds? Um, for the first question, I think it's uh, it's straightforward. Uh, use at weak coupling using our technology, and that can be done. And uh, at the strong coupling, I actually don't know how how this computation can go. Uh, I think. I think it's you cannot do it as strong coupling because you really rely on expanding this uh, vestomino plus uh, direct bond infield action and, and consider the small string a, a small perturbation. Mm -hmm. I mean, you should be able to do right. Maybe you cannot use the same technique, but uh... not with the same technique. No. Yeah. Not with the same technique, but maybe you need to invent some other technique. Yeah. But what would be, the, do, we, do we at least know what would be in principle the computation that one should do, but then it's too hard or in, even in principle, we don't know how to set it at, at strong coupling. Because for example, if it was the heavy uh, single trace operators, we would do three point function of three vertex operators, right? Then in practice, it's hard. You have to compute minimal areas and so on, but at least in principle, we know what the computation is. Do we know in principle, what's the computation with three Ds or even that is subtle? I think I, I don't know. Even uh -huh. though it's, uh, yeah. Would you know, Charlotte? Uh, mm, no, not immediately. No. Because even these guys, they are protected, even if they are even heavier than this, right? Even if they start deforming the geometry, the three point function would still be protected. Am I right? In any case, it should be true. Yeah. But then. Uh, then it's even tougher to imagine what it would be in mean, right? The three point function of three operators, each of them can deform the geometry, right? Are these operators, uh, if I take them further to deform the geometry, are these operators these that generate this Luni and Maldestana solutions, are they related to this? I think if you want to deform the geometry, you need to take even heavier guys like uh, yes. scales, like n square. Yes. Um, yeah, you have to insert n of those. N of those guys. Um, right. So if you take an operator that scales like that, so at n square, mm -hmm. then uh, even for those operators, the three point function is just computed at three level, right? It's fantastic. But then at strong coupling, it's like joining three different geometries. Yes, that's, that's fascinating, yes. It's impressive that we can have access to that. OK, thank you. Yeah, in string theory, you've been putting in three guys. Like, what, what is the picture? It's like a, a disk with three different boundaries or patches with different boundaries. It's hard to think. Sorry, can you can you can you be a bit more precise? So you are saying so, that so, I would do so, a disk and the disk with one boundary is one D brain, but uh, yeah. What so 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 what? So if you compute like um, ah okay, you mean an analog with two holes? Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. If you have an analog with two holes. Each of them. okay, so that would be for the dual of these three DMs, right? Yeah, I think so. Okay, and for the ones I said, the heavier ones. That's even worse because uh... that would be uh, because that's very non-planar, right? Yeah, exactly. So that would be uh, really a coherent state of such. Uh, exactly. Pieces. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, maybe, or even messier, actually. No, yeah, probably messier, right? It's more like string field theory, right? It's not a world sheet computation, right? You really change background, so. Yeah. Anyway, probably. okay, uh, it's fantastic. It's, I never thought about it before, yeah. It's curious On the other hand, we have in, access to all this protected stuff, even when they are super heavy and not aligned at all. Yeah. Okay, sorry, you're fine for- uh, No problem, it's, it's great. I'm almost done, actually. <laughs> um, yeah, so this is the result for ABJM theory. Um, assuming that our prescription is correct and uh, we, we did the computation for ABJM. Now, since in ABJM, this thing is not protected, 
So at the moment, we don't have a, a good way to check it. So this just provides the data for us to check against the, the future integrability, tech, uh, integrability, integrability prediction. And uh, let me mention that we can also compute off-diagonal structure constants, uh, but for fixed M and K. So we don't, um, so the closed form, we, we didn't obtain it, and it's probably possible, but very complicated. And finally, we can also compute uh, correlation functions beyond the twisted translated sector. So uh, as I mentioned before, you have this uh, expansion of tensor structures, and you can actually compute uh, each one of this number. Uh, using this uh, prescription. Um, so that's it. Uh, let me let me conclude. Uh, first, uh, I I I think I try to convince you that higher point correlation functions in ABGM theory needs to be explored because we didn't know much about it. And if we seriously want to solve ABGM theory, then uh, a lot of work has to has to be done. And I think correlators involving D brains might be uh, a simplest possible setup that we can start this uh, exploration. So then at weak coupling, we show that um, the uh, giant gravity on one point function can be mapped to the overlap of boundary state and the beta state. So we give the selection rule and the prediction. And uh, at strong coupling, uh, we clarified what is the good prescription. And uh, this involves taking the orbit average and the wave function contributions. Uh, so all this, uh, these results has to be used to test the finite coupling prediction. Uh, so looking ahead, actually, there are a lot of things that uh, we can do, and uh, some of them we are already working on. So first is about the finite coupling. So this is an ongoing project with the, with the same authors. So one of the things we are now doing is finding solutions of, uh, of crossing equations. And uh, so this is a bit, uh, harder compared to the SU uh, to the n equals four case because uh, there we really need data. If we have data, we can guess the result uh, much easier. But now we have less data, so um, I guess we we cannot fix it uh, so easily uh, with uh, like in n equals four. And also there are some other uh, technical complications. But uh, in any case, this is the ongoing project. And uh, at weak coupling, I think there are some interesting questions we can do. Uh, first, we can compute uh, other correlation functions like the BPS, BPS, uh, non-BPS single trace operators. And, um, and also uh, we can do more things with this SU4 uh, beta and uh, This spin chain can be further explored. Um, so I, I mentioned that this is, uh, we have the coordinate beta and uh, but then, a lot of things about this spin chain are still unknown. For example, in, in n equals four and uh, these higher rank spin chains, we know how to solve the beta and equation using this uh, method of Q system. Uh, but in the SU4 case for this uh, alternating spin chain, uh, these technologies are not yet developed. So we didn't manage to find all the beta and solutions, all the physical solutions for a given quantum number. And it would be very nice to, to have such results in order to test or to, to go beyond. So at a strong coupling, uh, uh, we, uh, revisit, uh, we can revisit some computations because in the literature, uh, a lot of heavy, heavy light computations, they, they didn't take into account the uh, orbit average. So uh, there might be some issues there. And also this prescription, we can apply it to uh, other contexts like the, the black hole physics and the fuzzy balls and so on. Um, so I will end here. Thank you very much for your attention. Yeah, thank you, Nikhil. Uh, let's uh, unmute yourself and thanks, Nikhil. Um, and questions, please. I have a question. Is this uh, orbit averaging somehow related to the fact that, uh, for example, in the LLM story to uh, identify some half BPS operator, you have to do some sort of averaging there. There's a story of Skanderis and Taylor about that. Um, yes. Like you, it's not, you know, the map between 
uh, state and the sure polynomial is not straightforward. You have to do some sort of averaging there. Is it related to this orbit averaging that you guys are talking about? Let's see. I'm not familiar with this uh, Skinder's uh, Miller story. Um, but I don't have a smart comment, but probably you can you can ask Jota. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, I also have a question about orbit average. Um, when you um, study with, uh, some, some correlation function of the Wilson loop uh, rather than the giant gravitons, then the gravity dual may be as similar, but in a different slice of the space time. Then do you think you also need orbit average in that case? Yeah. I think if, if you are in the situation that if you pick a specific solution, you break the symmetry, then in order to restore that, you will have to do the orbit generating. This is only for global symmetry or, yeah, because uh, sometimes the symmetry is not linearly realized and it's very hard to find this uh, hidden structure, then, mm -hmm. then you don't know which is the uh, space of integration. I mean, <laughs> if, if you completely know the underlying symmetry, you can say, okay, this is a correct orbit average prescription, but if you don't know symmetry, then there's some ambiguity when to stop. Yeah. So uh, in our cases, this uh, symmetry is rather simple, and uh, we can just it, but I don't know in the general case, um, how would you identify the symmetry, especially in your case? Okay, so if no other questions, then let's uh, thank you and thank you again. Um, thank you. Uh, thank you for the very interesting talk. And um, uh, the next uh, seminar uh, will be by Kanika Um next Thursday. And so, See you next Thursday and goodbye. See you. See you. Bye.